Welcome viewers to Channel 17 Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. I'm Margaret Harrington, your host for Focus. And uh, viewers, let's welcome our guests in the studio, Dr. Terence Cuneo from Williston, Vermont, and, and Carrie Cuneo from Williston, Vermont. And we're going to talk about the fracked gas pipeline in Vermont today. And I've, my first question to both of you is, what has been the impact of the fracked gas pipeline on your lives here in Vermont? Well, it's had quite an impact um, on our lives. Um, it's, it's been a, a sobering experience for us, an eye-opening experience, and, and in a lot of ways, a painful experience for us. The long and short of things is we are moving from our property because they're going to uh, uh, lay a frack gas line through what was our property um, and um, you know basically restart our lives so it's been a, a really big disruption for us our, our family for children um, when we bought our property I think we didn't have any expectation that um, there would be a, a gas line that would be put through it but roughly three years ago uh, we were approached by Vermont gas and we're told that um, a frack gas line was going to go through our property. We didn't know anything to speak of, uh, pipelines or anything. We were, we were pretty naive and ignorant. Um, the more we looked into it, the more nervous it made us, um, and uh, the less we liked what we saw, really. Um, so some of the questions that we had to ask ourselves, you know, first of all was, what was this going to do to the value of our home and the property, having a gas line through our property? It's going to basically bisects uh, our 10 acre um, uh, plot of property that was mm -hmm. once ours, we no longer own it now. Um, it's a 75 foot um, corridor. corridor, yeah, so it goes right through. Um, uh, what would it do to the value of our property? Um, um, what would be the implications of having someone else own a, a chunk of land right in the middle of our property? Um, we were concerned about the dangers about um, pipelines and, and the like. And we were trying to see what the, the rationale was for, for doing this. Um, so um, I can talk about uh, those four issues uh, at more length. Um, maybe begin with um, um, what it would do with regard to the value of our home. We just didn't know. There wasn't any good information about um, you know, what ha uh, having a uh, frack gas line going through your property does to the value of one's home. There was, uh, you know, no precedent for it in Vermont, really. Um, we were offered initially a, a rather small percentage of the value of our property, not our house and our property, but our property, as uh, uh, a sort of a damage settlement. That was a very low uh, sum. Um, and so that really puzzled us as to what the formula was we're figuring out. Right. Um, was we, that was that offer made initially? Initially, when you yeah. when you when you did say you didn't want the pipeline or what? Well, that was what the the initial offer that was put on the table. And oh. what happened after that was a series of negotiations, really over years. Um, yeah. And from years. the beginning, they had told us that if we asked them, what happens if we don't accept this? And they said that it would go to eminent domain. Right. And what did you do then? We continued to say no. Yeah. We continued to say we did not want this through our land. Our kids walked to school across where the pipeline would go, and we did not want this in our land. Um, and, and so one of the main reasons was, well, okay, if we wanted to sell our property, what, you know, who knows um, you know, what we could sell the property for, right. given uh, that it had a gas line going through it. So that was one issue. Another issue was simply surrendering uh, a chunk of our land to someone else where, in this case, uh, a company would own, it, would own it. It could do what it wanted with it. It could uh, potentially put another um, gas line through. Um, um, it had the right, would have the right to sell it to someone else in perpetuity. In perpetuity. Um, so uh, the thought of a company coming in and having that sort of control over what was once one's land was not attractive to us at all. Um, I think both of us, we would like to think of ourselves as reasonable people. And uh, if there was a good enough reason to do that sort of thing, it really was something that would benefit the common good and our fellow Vermonters. You know, we would think very seriously about doing that. 
um, sometimes I thought about what we would answer if someone said, hey, let's put you know, a field of solar panels in your land. I mean, ugly to look at, but on, on, the, on the other hand, I would, I would think, well, you know, there might be something that's actually good coming out of this. Uh, we, we didn't feel that way about the, the pipeline at all. Um, uh, so there was that, that second element, third, the dangers. As we looked into um, uh, you know, what happens with pipelines, uh, it's pretty alarming. You know, it's not something that's in the public consciousness at all. But what became clear to us is there are, I think, over two million miles of pipeline in this country. There is a federal regulatory agency that oversees it that's staffed by, I think, 200 people. So um, most of the regulation is given to the states. And as it turns out, in Vermont, there is no state regulatory agency that you know, regulates pipelines and their safety and so on, so on and so forth. And I think in the last 20 years, this regulatory agency reports over 11,000 incidents with regard to, to pipelines. So, and there was a neighborhood in, in Seattle, in which I used to live, in which they had an explosion and blown up. And oh boy, if you, if you look um, at what happens, there are, there are just a lot of issues, a lot of dangers. And so, um, how long, how far away is their house from the pipeline? Three? It was about 300 feet. Yeah, so we're in the so-called incineration zone. If anything happens, we're goners. Um, so that really alarmed us. Um, uh, and I don't think we're the paranoid type, but it was something that uh, we would much rather not have on our own property. Yeah. Um, and as I said, we, you know, we would try to, to think through these issues carefully and sensitively um, looking for um, a good rationale as to you know, why it would be that the state would uh, exercise eminent domain, condemn our land by eminent domain. And boy, it was really hard for us to see a good reason. Uh, mm -hmm. If we were to sort of go down, go down the list of reasons that for us it didn't make any sense, we could do that if, if you'd like to talk about that. There, first of all, there was the financial dimensions of the project. It's what started out as something like $70 million project $78 million is now $158 million, um, so it's way, way over budget. And um, what's most alarming about that is you know, who pays for the cost overruns, who's paying for the infrastructure of this thing. Well, who does pay yeah, it's for the ratepayers. It's the ratepayers. So, um, and it's the ratepayers in other areas of Vermont, too. Vermont, that's right. right. It's the yeah. Vermont ratepayers. And um, according to some of the figures I saw, it's something like, on average, uh, the ratepayers pay $8,000 for this thing. It's not going to pay for itself for another 33 years. Um, so this is you know, this is a financial albatross, right. uh, as, as best I can and tell. The, and the rates themselves, right? Wasn't there a promise that the rates for power would go down? Well, I think there was talk along that line, yeah. along those lines. Um, you know, whether that's really going to be the case, <laughs> right. um, um, I, I, I don't have enough knowledge about uh, all the issues at hand, but uh, I'd be, I'd be very surprised if it, you know, that would turn out to be true. Um, so, and there's also uh, policy issues involved. Um, so Vermont has its comprehensive energy plan says, okay, by 2050 we're going to be 90 percent in renewables, and here we are building this you know, really extensive fossil fuel infrastructure that's going to keep us on fossil fuel for another hundred years. And for me, at least, it was really hard to see how would all this, this pipeline fit in with comprehensive energy plan. Right. Um, this is gonna sound barred, but it really did seem to me as if um, what Shumlin was up to, and I do think he's the main figure behind this pipeline, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not saying anything that's, that's news when I say that. Um, it just looks to me like a schizophrenic sorts of, sort of policy. On the one hand, we have Vermont trying to divest from fossil fuels and this comprehensive energy plan which is, I think, forward-looking and really attractive. And then this, and it's really, really hard to fit this together. Um, at least, yes. I don't see any way to. Um, no. and, and I, I think the government, the governor has been totally unapologetic about this. He is stuck by this right. thing, uh, come hell or high water. And what about the, uh, there's a Department of Public Services that is supposed to act on, on behalf of the citizens of Vermont? Well, that's right. Um, you know, this is one of the more sobering aspects for us of the, um, um, in this situation, seeing how the Department of Public Service and the Public Service Board operates. Um, 
uh, as best I can tell, there's a long history of the Department of Public Service basically making decisions entirely in the interest of the utility companies, so this is not new. Mm. Um, I think at the outset of this process, we were handed a very complicated legal document. Uh, we would have been fools to sign it. Uh, we needed legal representation. We needed people to interpret this. Um, uh, the Department of Public Service offered no help in any of this. It was only when a group of Landovers went to the governor and forced the Department of Public Service to provide the sort of help for homeowners to hire attorneys to make sure everything was on the legal up and up. Mm -hmm. So it's the sort of thing where, it was, for me, it was really, really difficult to see that they were looking after the interests of uh, average Vermont people, uh, homeowners such as us, um, quite the opposite. It seemed like they didn't care at all, and only when push came to shove were they willing to make moves on our behalf. So um, for me, um, yeah, it's been, uh, I think, a wake-up call to how things work uh, in Vermont. And I believe Shumlin appointed three of the Public Service Board uh, members. Yes. Yeah, I think so they, you know, they serve at the, mm -hmm. at the pleasure of the governor. Right. Um, and the governor has a two-year term. At, uh, he has to yeah. run, mm -hmm. as he did run, for yeah. three terms. So this is so. You know, a bit problematic. I, I, think, I, I think what bothers me is that, as best I can tell, um, the Department of Public Service is accountable to no one. Right. Mm -hmm. There is no body that I can see that oversees what they're up to, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, or, or if there is, I'm not aware of what it is. Right. And 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 when we were looking for support, we certainly didn't see it. So, mm -hmm. but certainly on paper, they are tasked with looking out for the interest of of the landowners. That's right. That's right. And you're saying that they didn't come through. Um, so. Not at all. And yeah. and when it, when. Um, uh, uh, they were forced to to make some moves on our behalf. They, you know, they did make some moves, so I don't I don't want to um, not give credit where credit's due. Some moves were made, but uh, they certainly didn't go out of their way and certainly weren't proactive. And it was only because landowners got together and petitioned the governor on this on this issue. So um, yeah, I, I think one of the the largest takeaway messages for us was it's really really difficult to see how. This department is looking after the interests of ratepayers and, and average Vermonters. And then the the Public Service Board is another agency that is yeah. supposed to be looking after landowners and 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 citizens of Vermont. Yeah. yeah. So you know, as best I can tell, they've basically um, you know sided with the utility companies on all across the board again. Uh, mm. So, this so, is so I find this quite disturbing in, in a lot of ways. Look, look, they have access to the same evidence that you and I have access to. Mm. And look, they see the cost overruns. They see the number of Vermonters that are actually going to receive gas from this pipeline, which is a, a very small number of people. Mm -hmm. 3,000? 2,000, I think he said. Two or 3,000. Yeah. So we're talking a very small, okay, so is it creating jobs as best as we can tell? No. Um, uh, it does benefit some larger entities such as Cabot Cheese and Middlebury College, and they'll be paying lower rates than the rest of us that, who, if we had gotten uh, 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 gas from the pipeline, w would be paying. Um, but, you know, that's not the job of the Department of Public Service or the PSP to look after the interests of, of large companies. So um, they're supposed to be looking out for the interests of us. So. Um, that was that was really, as I say, um, disturbing in a lot of ways to, to see sort of the, the the lack of response to the evidence, and and quite frankly, the, the thing that I think disturbs me the most is that we have incredibly strong scientific evidence at this point about the effects of fracking on the environment. Right, something mm -hmm. like. 50 million tons of, of methane released into the environment, unburned methane released into the environment uh, you know, every year. 80% um, uh, more potent than carbon as a greenhouse gas. So this is an you know, unmitigated disaster, right? This is really, really bad. And as far as I can see, this is just absolutely the number one issue that we've got to be dealing with as a state, as a country. Um, and they see this evidence, and they're doing nothing about it, right? They, they, they're unwilling to take it into account and say, you know, maybe this is not such a great idea. Let's switch gears. Let's invest money in renewables. Um, you know, 
cold climate heat pumps or whatever, which is ju are just as cost effective, if not more cost effective. So I, I find it baffling, to be very honest with you, you know, the response to both uh, citizens and, and uh, the evidence we have about the environmental destructiveness. So you're saying that, that the state policy is on behalf of the corporation, right? That's of, what it looks like. Yes, it's, so that's it what sure it looks, looks like, like to that me. way to me. Um, From the way you're talking about yeah, it. To the point where they're willing to condemn our land in order to put uh, uh, a frac gas line in. Transmission line, we yeah. wouldn't even get gas. Uh, so it's, this is not a distribution yeah. line. Yeah. Like most Vermonters, we would not receive any gas from the line. So, and the time frame for you, this has been going on for how long? It's for three years. Three years, yeah. yeah. They came back to us several times with a better, better offer. Mm -hmm. um, and we still said, no, we don't want this through our land and eventually asked them to go around, but they said that would cost too much money to go around us. Yeah, and they have gone around in some places. Yeah, other people, places, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. Apparently we're, at, we're in location where it's expensive for them to go around us. So they're not going to go around us. No. Um, so at the end of the day, um, uh, uh, you know, we were um, incurring very substantial legal bills. We were in eminent domain. Early in the process, we had asked Vermont Gas whether they were interested in, in buying our property, and, and we just moved. Mm -hmm. um, they, were, they said that they were uninterested in doing that. Uh, they preferred to um, not do that. And so rather late in the game, they came to us and said, okay, we'll, we'll buy your property. Um, and eventually we agreed to do that. Um, we, we really didn't see, quite honestly, any other option for um, other than having the pipeline put through our property. You're describing a, an incredibly painful process that you went through. Yeah, I mean, how much money can you give for your home, right? I mean, for us, it's, you know, there, there is no price tag we could put on our home. Um, and you know, where our children have, have grown up. So yeah, you know, we didn't want to move. We, we had no interest in moving. And it's uh, convenient to where you're a professor of oh, philosophy yeah. yep. at the University of Vermont, and uh, you have a short commute from there, right? That's right. I can, I can, I can cycle into my, my, my job, and she can do the same thing. Our kids walk to school, walk to school and um, it's a short commute to CVU where one of our daughters uh, was in high school, so it's you know, optimally um, located as far as our lives go, and you know, so we're seeing all that disappear at this point. Mm -hmm. Would would you have, uh, looking back now over the three years, would you yourselves have done anything differently? Oh, it's a good question. Um, yes, I think there are things we would have done differently. I think we would have been. Uh, um, quicker to educate ourselves. More uh, active. More active in the community about educating our fellow citizens in Williston. Mm -hmm. um, my impression was that people in Williston more or less shrugged their shoulders and you know, that was that. They yeah. just were not you know, terribly interested in what was going on, the environmental effects. I think most people didn't know. They came yeah. to your door and told you that you needed to sign this piece of paper because they were putting a transmission line in. I think most people just didn't know right. what was happening. We fortunately had some people that came to us and said, you know, I think you should look twice at this. Yeah, look into this carefully. Yeah, and so we did, but I don't think everybody had that. They moved yeah. very quickly in the beginning um, to get everybody to sign. Right. Yeah. But, but we were living our lives. You know, we had we yes. busy lives. Busy, so, I mean, sure. We, we have four we, kids. You know, we literally <laughs> had to put you know, major parts of our lives on hold, even mm. to understand the legal dimensions, the environmental dimensions, and so on and so forth of this project. Um, so uh, if we were to do it over, we would have gotten up to speed more quickly. We would have, I think, tried to um, uh, be more public about um, what this project was all about. Um, so. Uh, that's, that's looking in the rearview mirror. And well, thank you so much for yeah. coming here now yeah. to, to, to help us in the, in the present and going forward in Vermont. But tell us about Williston. What's going on in Williston right now? At the, there's a, a pre nature preserve? Oh, in Heinsberg. Oh, in Heinsberg. Heinsberg. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sorry, yeah. Heinsberg. So there, there is a, a flashpoint in, in Heinsberg. Uh, Geprags Park, which is a public park, mm -hmm. um, is designated as a location where the gas line is supposed to go through. Mm -hmm. um, 
there has been an ongoing controversy uh, about the negotiations of the select board in Heinsberg and Vermont Gas uh, about how that would all work out. Um, uh, some people will be aware of, of the details, but it's, to put it mildly, been very controversial. Um, but what it comes down to, I think, is most fundamentally is that this park was given to, the land for the park was given to the town by the Caprag sisters. Uh, so a covenant was formed between the town and the Caprag sisters that the park was to be used for recreational and educational purposes only. Um, and so now we have a case in which they want to put a frack gas line through the park. Um, the present route looks to be, uh, have some very, very serious environmental implications for the park. Um, moreover, it's not even clear that this is um, legally okay, that um, it's okay to exercise eminent domain with regard to a public park. And there is some legal precedent in a 1928 Middlebury uh, case which, in which the state said, no, it's not okay to do this. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of controversy here. Um, um, and I, I'm very, very interested to see how this is, this is going to work out. And at this point, some of the, the people in the town have stepped up to fight the case. Yeah. And so. Well, thank you very much for being on this program. It's our pleasure. And for bringing your strength and your wisdom to us. And I'm sorry on behalf of all Vermonters that you had to go through this and uh, this turmoil and loss. But you're going forward, right? We are indeed. You, you are going forward thank with, you. with your strength. Thank you so thank you. much, Professor, and thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, viewers.